the French text, uh, but. As soon as you start reading the second word, it's it's over, and you just start laughing. So, at any rate, very welcome to the uh, talk, Hacker Ethics. Um, many things are hacked from th for reasons of activism, fun, or just pure curiosity. And you keep having to ask yourself, how far can I go? What's okay? What isn't? Yes, that person is crap, but can I publish the info of everyone who has ever used their services? Well, someone in the audience has an opinion on that already. There are many cases where it isn't clear how to proceed. It's not like Hollywood where we have white hats and black hat hackers, the good and the bad. We are very often in a gray area and we have to consider what we do and there's that's where hacker ethics come in that's been a topic for a long time and today we get an introduction um, by Frank he has been a speaker at the CCC for years and he has been active in the CCC for years and I am very glad to have him here today and even for myself to just get a reintroduction to hacker ethics so let's welcome him with a a heartfelt round of applause. Well, thanks. So, hacker ethics. Hacker ethics, as used by the CCC, is not the youngest anymore. It was originally formulated or, or sketched out by uh, as an American journalist, Stephen Beale. He wrote a book on hacker culture in the 80s and that was put out in 1984, fittingly. And many of those rules and points that we use in the CCC hacker ethics come from there, really all of them. Some of these values that we that we hold high, we've adapted, or Wau Holland did back then, um, from there. And that's what I want to talk about today. Why? Why do we need something called hacker ethics? What's the point? Can't you just do what you want? You know, just fun with devices, no more thinking required. Well, our impulse here is that Power creates responsibility. As we look around who moves in hacker circles, it's people who know more, can do more than average, who have more energy, even though it doesn't always look that way, have this impulse to research things, this, this curiosity, this endless patience for finding out how things work and making things that look like magic from the outside, techno-magicians. And resulting from that, we have the possibility to do things that aren't that great, who are, that are bad, and where we can do wrong to people and abuse them and make them have worse lives. And we try to stop that and prevent that. And this idea that power creates responsibility is not as popular as it used to be in current society. We have this tendency to move away from the values of the Enlightenment and towards division and separation and towards this this idea of at least I myself can live my life and I don't care what these others do. Us here at this Congress especially believe that this is the wrong path and that we should value the values of enlightenment and, and fact-based communication and that we shouldn't go towards um, wishful thinking um, but to, based on what is. And one of the first rules um, of hacker ethics is that the access 
to computers and everything that can show you how this world works should be unlimited and complete. We had this value from enlightenment that the accessibility of knowledge, this, the availability of scientific results, and including documenting your source code, yes, I know, that this is a core of our being. The availability of information was a problem for a long time. Let's remember 1984. I can remember during the mid-80s when I wanted information on how to use computers and how it worked. I'd have to pirate uh, handbooks from the East German Republic. Um, as a person from the West, it was very difficult to get information in the mid-80s. Remember, information was, was, was not easy to get at that time. And accessibility and availability was not as uh, free as today. If you wanted to have uh, information on a microprocessor from the East German Republic, you'd have to look for a long time. Today, you just take your smartphone out of your pocket and then you just look it up online in a search machine of your choice and you'd have the information. But still, the question of getting the information is still uh, a question of political activism today because we now have the problem that information is being paid for by giving away information, for example, when you look and search on Google, or when you look at, um, at uh, publishers that sell information uh, related to scientific publishing. That is also not free. So access to information is still a very important question and topic. A uh, radical way on formulating this is to say that all information must be free. For some time, I don't know if you remember it, on the, at the Chaos Communication Congress, we showed network statistics. Uh, we had a nice graph on uh, that showed that we uploaded more data than we downloaded. There was, there was, those were good congresses. There's also the flip of the coin. All information, well, pretty much all information, uh, dealing with all information, we have to have the following rule. We need to protect private data and public data must be useful. That's a good rule, so that nobody is forced to allow access to his personal information. It's not normal that other people have access to your personal information. It's not normal that when you use a messenger, all your contacts get uploaded to another server from people that haven't... Um, to who has, didn't understand that their private data might have a value which might affect their personal possibilities and the choices that they can make and what they can do. This, yes, we, remember, we're talking about 1984 here. Here saying public data, public data that benefits us all knowing how traffic flows, for example. When is it possible to take the train? Like Simple data like, like schedules for trains. There are talks at the Congress about these topics. This is never growing old. The state and the big companies sit on this, these huge public data uh, which can improve our future and allow us to have a better time. But our private data, where we were, with whom, what we like, what we did, what we pay for, what we, what we buy, 
what we wish for, these highly private data, those, those are being privatized and sold to the highest bidder. Especially Facebook and, and Google and some other companies have gathered in huge amounts private data and sold it and and that shows that this field is still current and still relevant and as we are being creative and critical with technology we quite often run into these conflict areas it, just today um, somebody sent me a mail having found a, a database with data of thousands of people, highly private data, and, and he asked me, what do I do now? W what do I do? Should I make it public? Sh should I try talking to the service provider? Should I ignore it? Should I send a mail to all of them and, and tell them, hey, look, your data is freely available on the internet? And that's not an easy choice. You've got to great power there, you can do a lot of crap there and it's going to affect a lot of people's lives very negatively. And handling this responsibility is not always easy. At past congresses, on my phone number we had the hacker ethics hotline where we said if you coincidentally stumble across things where you think that might be dangerous, call us. And almost always the calls we got were about data that was badly protected. And we were always in this kind of bind there. Our advice was always do the least amount of harm that still ensures that this bad situation is fixed. And typically that meant talking to the provider of these systems. If you are in such a situation, come to us. We'll help you how to do that. It's usually a lot easier if your call is, Hi, um, I'm Frank Riegel from the KS Com Computer Club. Um, I'd like to talk to your technical manager. Typically, I get through immediately versus if you try, hello, I'm John Doe, I have your data, that usually doesn't work out so well. Heiser Security um, does something similar there, so we're not the only ones, but, I mean, we try to help promote others who and help others who can handle these cases in a qualified manner. And... The next question is, of course, do these companies really have a sense of wrong uh, and, and right? Uh, do they even care? Do they just ignore it? And so what we encounter um, here is often this embracing strategy. Oh, how wonderful that you call. Um, it's great that you want to help us, but we're going to take half a year to do that. And yeah, that's a real issue and they, they play for time and they, they, they waste time. And during that time, the data is typically still unprotected in the internet, which is not acceptable at all. So fixing these, these bad situations has to be highest priority. It's a question how we can um, make uh, the public data also public, um, which is the um, the lesser version of all of information must be um, public. Um, we have that example of of the publication of all the law um, files of all the laws in in Germany that are were made public and you usually think that um, we have this is this is common but uh, actually we see now well it isn't um, be because um, there's 
So that was really quick. And then the justice minister um, announced that all laws will be available for free in the future. So you see, it works. And this and this prospect that your own activism can change something that you're doing can actually do something the knowledge that you can change something that's what it's about in hacker ethics it's not true that nothing will change out there if you don't do the right thing at the right time a very important point to make since the beginning of the Chaos Computer Club is that we do not want to judge hackers and female hackers, well, just hackers in general, um, on how they look or where they come from or how old they are. The only important thing is what they know, what they can do and what is their goal. And you always have to remember that that's a very radical kind of way to think. We're a meritocracy. We don't want to judge people on any based on any other criterion than what they can do and what they do. And that's something that, for example, conservatives um, are against. They say, well, a high status has to account for something, or people, they're not that different after all. And you always have to remember 1984. There was a time where nerds in classrooms, they were st being stuck into trash cans or toilets, for example where if you were good at maths, you were not the popular kid in school. And if you were a person that was interested in computer science and computers, you're not usually not the, the popular person in your class. And the CAS Computer Club has always been a home for such people. Most of us got there because that was the first time where we met people who had the same interests as us. And the prevailing feeling when you arrive at the Congress is you're at home, finally. Finally, you're with people who also value what I value and who are also interested in the things that I do and I'm interested in the things that other people do here at Congress. And this dogma that everyone is equal is something that we will not change. The next um, essential thing is distrust authorities and um, make decentralization stronger. Because one of because some circuits, of course, um, are more active than others in the Chaos Computer Club, but there is no headquarters or something like that. And if you look at how the Congress is organized, there's a huge number of teams of um, people who do it in their free time and who are looking simply for a task or a goal. And... Um, say, oh, we want to make this this part or this goal um, the best and, and we put all our energy into that. And this is how the Chaos Computer Club works on the whole. So you won't find any uh, big structure uh, laid out or the, the big um, association that's uh, organized like a pyramid. But um, it's rather think for yourself what you 
what you can do and um, and do it and and get get to people that are also doing it and don't wait for anyone to to say to tell you oh that's the direction to go. Um, so if you're looking for for this thinking of um, of of le leadership and um, leadership deciding uh, in which direction things go, then that's not the place. We have members, and they are they are um, uh, they are running around and doing things, and and from that stuff emerges. Of course, this ha does have this disadvantages like. Um, a strategy that's long time planned um, and you run into the situation where um, something simply doesn't happen which can have um, two um, two reasons like um, either there's no consensus or no one is interested in it the, the opportunities that we get from that um, they um, com complement each other well with other N NGOs who are more long-term focused. But yeah, we don't have that. We don't have that sen that headquarters deciding now we do that. We have people who think, oh, we have to do that now, and who have who who like doing this, who have fun that, and and then do it, and just think of it. The, the whole thing is 17,000 people and they're all doing that in their free time. In general, authority leads to structures settling and we want to uh, not do that if possible. Next, Part. Karina had that earlier with black hat, uh, described that earlier with white hat and black hat. Is the following. There's a. There's a call in right now, uh, which translators can't hear. But um, the t speaker is now apologizing. And now you can see the benefits of mistrust authority and decentralized because the authority in this room is now correcting your own talk. Okay, let's move on. The question is now, what do you do when you've hacked a system and now you have access to a database? Or, for example, you have the power to do things that you were not allowed to do or you couldn't do before. That's a question that's as old as this club. What do you do after you've hacked a system? First, I want to define the word hacking. Hacking is a more creative and also a more critical way of dealing with technological systems. And the question is now, what do you do? And that question is not easy to answer. In general, when we deal with such questions, we don't have a fixed set of answers. Instead, we try to uh, ask our own questions. And the most important question is, and what do you do now? What's, how do you want to continue? Surprisingly, most people don't ask themselves this question. You only think about, and then I will publish this data and I'll make a press announcement and that's all's going to be great. But in general, that's not going to work out well. Um, live mo people move on, life goes on, and then nothing of change will have happened. We have this responsibility 
that comes with um, the skill to intrude into other people's systems or to manipulate systems. And at this point, in, at a factor of scale that we considered impossible in previous times, last Congress, somebody came to me and they built a botnet. Well, just by accident, really. Yeah, for, for real, yeah. <laughs> they found a bug in, in a popular IoT device and they, well, they built a bot that sort of spreads. And they thought, well, you know, that'd be kind of fun if we could check other devices for the same bug in the same network. And, and I mean, the bot didn't do anything. It just spread and, and looked around and spread and phoned home and said, here I am. And well, then they kind of sat there with the low six-figure number of infected devices, IoT devices, and thought, hmm, well, now? Now what? What do we do? And usually you get complications there. In a perfect world, Hollywood scenario, you say, well, then you use that to uh, fix that bug and delete itself. And once you're done with that, then you tell the uh, supplier. Turns out you can't do that without doing damage. In some of the cases with certain firmware, hardware versions, uh, it would have happened that these devices would be broken afterwards. Well, it's not great, but on the other hand, you can say, well, I mean, somebody else might find it and then just use it to uh, build a DDoS network. So would that be better? Well, as it turns out, it resolved f fairly easily because the manufacturer noticed and 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 on their own initiative, patched it out and fixed it. And I mean, there's still a, a couple of thousand vulnerable devices, but that's not the same dimensions anymore. So it will be interesting to just think through this scenario. Because we have this scenario where we really have a vulnerability and uh, it's not a question of opening one server. With the devices and the, the bandwidth we have, we, we can find all the servers with a certain vulnerability and there's plenty of machines and if you build your patterns that are used to look for vulnerable devices well enough you can find you can almost find all the devices there and then suddenly you have tens of thousands hundreds of thousands millions of devices and it's not impossible it's not unlikely that you could find that many devices and there are cases where you prefer not to look I I found a vulnerability and I'm not going to check for it in any of these uh, in this uh, lookup patterns because I don't even want to know it's kind of irresponsible because you're not going to fix the issue that way but it's understandable so so far we've been talking about opening up systems and finding things And but a lot of us are busy building systems, however. So making sure that we, that our computers work, that databases work, and aside from the obvious responsibility that our systems are at least somewhat safe as far as things can be, there is a responsibility to towards what these systems do as well. And we have this problem of scale on the other side as well. Building a system today, let's say a dating portal, then in this dating portal we will get a lot of data, a lot of very private data. Do we want this data? Do we want to store this data in this way? Or can we risk that these will fall victim to some vulnerability that they are used in some criminal way? Or do we want to build systems that improve lives in, 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 
in the sense that they encrypt that data, that they don't even gather that data, that the people who use these systems are not left in the dark about what happens to their data. And as I look around, every year there is this map of companies that work in the ad space. Thousands of companies. Companies that do nothing but when you go to a, co to a website, the data from the cookies or whatever other identifying uh, identifiers you have are distributed as fast as possible and that people are able to bid upon what ads they want to show you. And I keep thinking, there must be people who program this shit. There must be people who sit down and do nothing else their day that the, these pictures of dramatically lit tubes of toothpaste arrive in my browser more quickly and they know that peppermint is better than strawberry for me. Is, is, is that really a life goal? Do, do you feel good while doing that? Does anybody here work? No hands. Do you know somebody who works there? Do they feel good? And I think hacker ethics also means thinking about what you do with your time alive, what you use your time for, what are the things you leave behind, what are the things you set in motion, the trends you create. And I think we should all think about that a bit more. I mean, I don't judge anyone who works in this field because everybody has to pay their rent. But maybe we should try and work on things that create a positive change. A lot of us do. But some of us... And, and it's okay to, to say I work in a more shady field of IT, but in return I get more free time, and in my free time I do good things. But it's worth thinking about. It's worth thinking about the systems we build, the things we do, and whether they align with our interests and improve the world. And it's occasionally a good idea to sit down and think about these topics. It doesn't matter whether you build systems or whether you hack systems. A good question or a good uh, thing to say is that the goal doesn't make the way you do things um, good. What would, for example, happen when someone does the same thing that you do, except you are the target? And of course, you can make this hypothesis more beautiful. But one question, or one question is, for example, what do you do when you have a political enemy? What do you do? Would you feel the same way if instead of hacking a political enemy, it would be happen to your friend? You could, for example, say, well, maybe I should have thought about this a little bit more. One variant of this is, do we shoot birds with cannons? For example, look, I've opened this online shop. The system was a little bit older and I've uh, hacked the system, so I found 2,500, 2,600 people who buy uh, chocolate cakes. Is that relevant? Does your, uh, is this very exciting to you? But well, then you have to say, well, then you'll just have to talk to the owner of this online shop, he'll have to update his PHP, and then uh, it will be fixed, but is that a big deal? That's the question. We don't have to really make a press announcement. Yeah, for example, uh, chocolatecakesonline.com, that's a fictional address. 
is that does it really matter if something like that happens? It's important when you deal with very sensitive data, uh, maybe data that was stored in a very, very amateur way. In such cases, it could happen that we make a press announcement. One of the most beautiful parts of hacker ethics is that you can create art and beautiful things with a computer. To most of us, this is uh, very obvious because most art you experience uh, comes from a computer, for example, animations and movies. But if you go down to the assembly area and you look at what people do with their computers, how beautiful it is, how much aesthetic aesthetics are in there, the charm, it's obvious. And the interesting thing is, back in the day, it wasn't that way. Computers were technical machines. And uh, if you really, really, really um, abuse the systems, you could have maybe a graph. For example, a fractal Mandelbrot graph or something like that. You could print it out maybe and p put it on a wall. Remember the year 1984. Still, one of the things that uh, impacts me and which I feel good about is when computers make art. The last point in hacker ethics is one of the most controversial, especially if you're coming from the field of IT security. For example, when you wake up on Monday morning and you read the news, and then you think, and you read the news, IT security news, then you think, oh, maybe I should have not gone into this field of work, maybe I should have raised pigs or sheep. IT security is a field in which you always have the feeling of nothing, it's always getting worse, nothing is getting better. But don't be so cynical. We shouldn't be so cynical. It is a truth that, in general, computers make lives of people better. I sometimes go around at Congress and ask people how have computers changed their life for the better. There are people who have disabilities, who are older, um, who can't orient themselves, and they have computers that help them in dealing with their daily life. Most of us wouldn't even know how to live their life without any kind of computer or smartphone. We wouldn't really know how to get information without a computing device. Well, let's have a look. Yeah. Who was in the library in the last four weeks? So, you see, a few people have raised their hands. We're not lost after the zombie apocalypse. Anyway, the realities are that not only information retrieval, but also communication, all the things where you have to orient yourself, navigation, for example. For example, Wikipedia in your pocket, things where you can download or access so that you can go on holiday without the need for books. These are things that computers do, that we have built, and these are also things that we can extend and make better. All the negative aspects we've talked about, they're also very interesting. Think about the hate in, so at so in social media, the division in society because facts don't matter anymore. These are true, but they shouldn't... Um, they shouldn't disparage us. Nobody will die when Facebook uh, is shut down tomorrow, for example. 
sollten nicht den Fehler begehen zu sagen so, ach, diese Computer, das ist doch alle doof. But we shouldn't make the mistakes of saying, oh, all these computers are all bad. So if, if someone is working with wood or if, if they're soldering, which is great, but this sentence still retains its viability. So in this sense, thank you for listening and have fun with your divide.